we're going to look at Le Chatelier's principle, which is a principle concerning equilibrium. And Le Chatelier is a guy that came up with it, and basically it states that a system will always achieve equilibrium. So if we do something to disturb equilibrium, then the chemical reaction is going to proceed in the direction either right or left toward products or toward reactants to reestablish equilibrium. So we are able to, we can upset equilibrium, and I think about equilibrium as a balance, and we can do that in a couple of ways, by either changing the concentrations of reactants or products, or we could change the temperature of a reaction because the temperature definitely affects the equilibrium constant or we could change the pressure by changing the volume or um, so other ways of doing that if we have a gas reaction. So equilibrium is something that uh, we don't want to happen because remember for equilibrium we have reactants forming products at the same rate that products are forming reactants. So remember, equilibrium is when these two rates are equal. So for the chemist, at equilibrium, the concentration of our products uh, has stopped changing. So our products uh, concentration is constant which means we stop making products, which means we stop making money. So upsetting equilibrium, and from a chemist's point of view, is a good thing to do as long as this shift uh, is always toward products. So when we consider changing the concentrations, I'm going to look individually at these. This one makes sense if we think about it. Um, if we remove products, which is not always that difficult to do, if we remove products, then the reaction will create more products. So the first one um, makes sense, okay, so by changing the concentration. Or what we could do, again this is for number one, or if we add reactants. We could upset the equilibrium concentrations by either removing products or adding reactants. So if we add reactants, that means we have too many reactants at equilibrium, so the reaction will shift toward products in order to undo what we did. So Le Chatelier's principle again states that the reaction will shift in a direction to restore equilibrium. So basically, whatever we do to the reaction, the reaction is going to proceed so that what we do, the reaction will undo. So if we add reactants, the reaction will remove reactants. But it can only remove reactants by creating more products out of that. Oops, reactants. This will still be by um, shifting to the right. So we could say shifting to the right or shifting toward products. So both of these will give us the same shift. So this will also be a shift right because reactants are on the left and products are on the right. So number one is kind of a no-brainer, and we'll do some examples on the next slide. For number two, if we change the temperature, we have to first consider what type of chemical reaction we have. So we have to analyze uh, whether we have an endothermic reaction, endothermic, or an exothermic reaction. Most reactions give off heat, so this exothermic means heat is produced, or I like to think about it as heat is a product, and 
endothermic, he's, heat has to be absorbed by the reaction to proceed. So we can think of this as heat is a reactant. Now, technically, a reactant is some sort of matter, a chemical equation, and heat is a form of energy, but we can think about that. So if we look at an exothermic reaction, any exothermic reaction can be written like this. Reactants create products plus heat. And an endothermic reaction, endothermic, would be heat is on the reactant side. So heat plus reactants is going to result in products. So the exothermic reaction, we would have a delta H value that's less than zero. That would be a negative delta H value. And an endothermic reaction, the delta H value is going to be positive. So the enthalpy of the reaction or heat of the reaction. And so if we're going to work a problem out of the book, the problem has to tell us whether we have an endothermic or exothermic reaction or it may do that, <coughs> excuse me, indirectly by giving us the sign of delta H. So if we consider most reactions are exothermic, well, let's consider that case. The exothermic reaction means reactants goes to products plus heat. So if we have this as an equilibrium reaction, <clears throat> then if we increase the temperature, so a temperature increase um, is analogous to uh, increasing heat, which the way we've written it is the same as adding product. So for an exothermic reaction, we want to change the equilibrium by changing the temperature. If we want to continue making more products, then lowering the temperature, lowering the temperature of an exothermic reaction will be the way to cause the reaction to shift toward the right. Or cause a shift to the right toward products. Now this imposes a bit of a problem because again most chemical reactions are exothermic. A negative delta H value means we're going downhill in energy, so that's very common. But running a reaction at a low temperature is going to quite significantly reduce the rate of a reaction. So, um, but in order to, if, if we're going to answer questions in, on a test or try to analyze problems, before we look at what the shift, you know, what a change in temperature will do, we have to know whether the reaction is endothermic or exothermic. And if we will write heat as a product for exothermic or as a reactant for endothermic, then increasing the temperature means we're adding heat to whatever side of the reaction that the heat is written on. And if we do that, then we can think about the shift will be just like removing products or adding reactants. So again, our exothermic reaction products include heat. So if we remove heat by lowering the temperature, that's going to cause the reaction to shift toward the right. Just like removing products, with, if we have compounds here, changing those concentrations, will cause the reaction to create more products. Okay, so that one's going to be a little bit confusing, but we'll work an example on the next slide. The third thing, by 
changing pressures. Here, all we have to care about is total moles of a gas. So for example, if we have 3H2 plus N2 at normal temperatures, this would result in a gas phase reaction. So for pressures, we only consider the moles of the gases. And we're going to assume we have ideal gases, so there's not going to be a distinction between hydrogen and nitrogen. So on this side of the equation, we have four moles of a gas. And on the other side of the equation, we only have two moles of a gas. In reality, we have all of these gases in the same container. But if we think about two moles of a gas is going to cause less pressure than four moles of a gas. So this will cause more pressure than two moles. So before we analyze what a pressure change is going to do, we first have to consider how many moles of a gas we have on each side. So for this particular reaction, if I want the shift to be toward product, so I want the shift to be toward products, which that's what I'm going to want if I'm going to be making a profit off of making ammonia, then I'm going to want to run this reaction at high temperatures. So if I increase, I mean, did I say temperature? I meant pressure. If I increase the pressure, and I could do that by reducing the volume, if I have this gas in a cylinder that has a piston in it. But if I increase the pressure, then the reaction will shift to decrease the pressure. And so in this case, since two moles of a gas actually results in less pressure than four moles of a gas, then this reaction above will shift to the right toward products. So we actually analyzed this for the Haber process, which is the formation of ammonia from hydrogen and nitrogen. We see that we wonder how we could make any money off of this. Because if I want to get a good yield out of this, Get more products, I'm going to have to run this at very high pressures, and then that costs a lot of money to maintain a high pressure. And if I want this process to work, if I look at the temperature change for the Haber process, uh, we have the same reaction. Hydrogen plus nitrogen gas making two ammonias. The delta H for this, if we look in a thermodynamics table, is negative 92 kilojoules. I kind of got that squeezed in there. But like most reactions, this reaction is also exothermic. So if I want this reaction to run and favor products or shift to make more products, I'm going to want to run this at a lower temperature. So if we reduce the temperature, the reaction is going to proceed to the right to increase the temperature. And the bad thing about running a reaction at a low temperature means that the, that's going to slow down the rate. So it's a wonder that we can make it. What we are able to do with the Haber process, it's fairly easy to remove the products. So if we consider ammonia, NH3 is polar. Hydrogen and Nitrogen are very nonpolar, so there are very few intermolecular forces of attractions here. These have very low boiling points. Ammonia has a, the strongest intermolecular force of attraction, the ability to have hydrogen bonding because of that big difference in electronegativity. So ammonia has a much higher boiling point than hydrogen and nitrogen. So it's not that difficult to get nitrogen into the liquid phase 
and then as a liquid, of course, it would drop to the bottom of the container, and we could probably remove ammonia as it's being made. Again, a summary of Le Chatelier's principle is that when a reaction is at equilibrium, if we disturb the equilibrium by imposing some sort of change to the reaction, then the reaction is going to shift to undo what we did. Or in other words, it will always restore equilibrium. These three things are easy things to change. And one and two we can think about similarly as long as we treat heat as either a reactant or a product. A pressure change, we have to consider only the moles of a gas and realize that fewer moles of a gas is going to cause less pressure on the system.